I want you to picture heaven in your mind. Just, just, just look that Jesus is going to be there. It will be a rainbow of color around that throne. It will be a rose garden of color praising God. It will be a kaleidoscope of color worshiping Jesus and the beauty and the unity of different people coming together is the real proof of a transformed life. Hey, it's Pastor Dudley of Lift Up Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us today on our broadcast. I'm going to be sharing some history lessons. I don't know about you, but I enjoy history. And if we fail to remember, then we're doomed to repeat it oftentimes. We want to learn the good and the bad, but then we want to go to the scriptures. And we want to see what God's word and God's will for us today as we move towards the future. And so I hope today you've got your Bible, hope you've got some notes, hope you'll invite some friends and join us today on our broadcast. But thank you for listening and for being here. I'm excited to preach for you this new series called The Sands of Time. Now we are in a series called The Sands of Time where we're glancing backward at historical events, and then we're looking and studying biblical principles as we look towards the future. And I want you to take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two. I have some very important verses to read and some things to explain to each and every one of us here today. But in honor of all you mothers out there today, I want to take us back to a period of time before, everybody say the word before, I want to take you back to a period of time before the Civil War. Now, of course, the Civil War, as far as context is concerned, was fought between 1861 and 1865 between the northern states, and you can see, I have a map here of the United States in 1860. And all those blue states are the northern states, which are called the, the Union. And uh, President uh, Abraham Lincoln was elected in the year 1860. And there was a war called the Civil War between the northern states and all of these southern states. And there were many causes for this war, many reasons why they were arguing. But the main reason they argued was the long-standing disagreement over slavery. And so they have this battle between the North and the South. The battle lasts for four years. 620,000 Americans die in that battle. Eventually, the North wins and four million slaves are emancipated. But before, say that word one more time, before, before any of that took place, before the bloody war was fought, back when slavery was wrongfully and immorally legal in the southern states, there was a secret underground railroad where blacks and some whites worked together underground to help slaves gain their freedom. It is estimated that the 50 years before the Civil War, from 1810 to about 1860, that 100 thousand slaves escaped using this clandestine network known as the Underground Railroad. If you're ever in Cincinnati, Ohio, right there on the river, they have the Underground Railroad Museum. But one of the heroes was a woman of the Underground Railroad. One of the heroes was a woman by the name of Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was a wife. She was a mother and she was a daughter, and she was truly one of America's superheroes. Harriet Tubman was born into slavery in East Maryland sometime around 1820. And in 1849, when she uh, was about 29 years of age, her slave owner died and she escaped from the plantation. 
And although she was illiterate, she returned to work as a conductor in the Underground Railroad. She personally was able to rescue over 70 slaves and never failed a single rescue. She was nicknamed Moses by those who knew her because like Moses leading the Israelites to freedom, she worked tirelessly to set her people free. I have another photo here of her. She's on the far left in this photograph, and all of these people pictured in this photograph are people that she personally helped uh, escape using the Underground Railroad. I think we need to give her a hand for her faith and for her bravery. Now, when the Civil War begins in 1861, Harriet Tubman joined the Union Army as a nurse. She eventually worked as a scout and as a spy. She became the first woman to lead 150 black Union troops in June of 1863 in a raid in South Carolina to help rescue 700 slaves. When asked why she worked so tirelessly and sacrificially, I want you to see this quote. She said, I had seen their tears and sighs, I had heard their groans, and would have given every drop of blood in my veins to free them. Look at this last line. She said, I would have given every drop of blood in my veins to free them. Now, when I read that line, who do you think I thought of? I thought of Jesus because Jesus didn't just say the words that he would give every drop of blood in his veins to set us free. He actually did give every drop of blood in his veins to set us free when he died upon that cross 2,000 years ago. Now, whenever the Bible talks about Jesus setting us free, as it does in Luke chapter 4, it's talking about setting us free from the sins that bind, setting us free from the sins that blind, setting us free from the sins that destroy, from the sins that condemn, setting us free from the sins that haunt us, setting us free from the sins that divide us, and I want to go on record here today. I mean, on the record. And I want to tell you that I hate the fact, literally hate, and I know that hate is a strong word, but I hate the fact that from the beginning of our nation, that slavery was a part of the fabric when this nation was founded. And I hate the fact, hate the fact, that it wasn't just at the beginning when our nation was being formed that slavery was acceptable, but that for the first 100 years of our nation's history that slavery was accepted up until the Civil War. And I hate the fact that even after President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation liberating slaves in the Confederate States, and after the 13th Amendment of the Constitution was approved in the year 1865, which abolished slavery in the entire United States, I hate the fact that for the next, for the next 100 years, from the 1860s to the 1960s, that African Americans were still not treated as equals and forced to endure the effects of racism and discrimination in every area of life. And I hate the fact that after a hundred years, after a hundred years after slavery was abolished, that a 42-year-old woman in the winter of 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, got arrested because she couldn't sit in the front of the bus simply because of the color of her skin. And I hate the fact that even today, I'm talking about today, 244 years since the birth of this nation, 
155 years since the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, and 60 years since the Civil Rights Movement began, that still today, that racism and discrimination still exist in this country, that we still have many damaging consequences from systemic racism in our country today. And for the record, you've got to understand, said all that to say this, that prejudices and inequality and discrimination among races, it goes all the way back to Bible times, all the way back to your Bible, except then the battle was not between blacks and whites, then it was the battle between the Jews and the Gentiles. Back then and even today, you're either Jewish or you're not Jewish. Right now, everyone who's listening to me, you're either Jewish or you're Gentile. And for some reason, there is something in our fallen, sinful DNA ways that we as humans have a difficult time seeing and treating all people as equals. I want to share with you four things, four things that I hope that you will never, ever, ever, ever forget. The first point is this. Hope you're writing this down. Heaven will be a diverse place. You might as well get used to it right now. Heaven will be a diverse place. You might as well get used to it right now. The Bible says, and this is Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, the Bible says when John uh, got a glimpse of what heaven is going to look like, this is a, this is a picture of what heaven's going to look like, he said, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. There's going to be a lot of people in heaven. And it says that from every nation, from every tribe, from every people, from every language, will be standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. That's what heaven's going to look like. It is so silly. I want to say stupid, but they tell me it's rude to call people stupid, so I say silly. But it's so silly, stupid, to not get along here on this earth with one another when one day we're going to spend all of eternity with one another in a place called heaven. I want you to picture heaven in your mind. Just, just. Just look that Jesus is going to be there. And all the way around him are, are going to be a multitude of people that too many people to even count. And they will be there from every tribe and every tongue and every language and every color and every nationality. And together we will be worshiping and praising Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. It will be a rainbow of color around that throne. It will be a rose garden of color praising God. It will be a kaleidoscope of color worshiping Jesus. And the beauty and the unity of different people coming together is the real proof of a transformed life. That's the proof of a transformed life. Our church, Shepherd Church, now if you don't go to our church, you wouldn't know this. But if you go to our church and you walked in here it looks like a rainbow in this church. We have approximately a fourth of our church are Latino, a fourth of this church are Asian, a fourth of this church are made up of African Americans, and about a fourth of this church is made up of Caucasian. There is no other church that reflects heaven as much as this church. And I don't know if you know this or not, but I want you to write this down in your notes. In the United States of America today, today, there are over three hundred thousand churches in america that today are still just one color just one color it's either all white all black all asian all latino and you know what i call that you can call it status quo but i call it sad because our church's mission not just our church but every church is to go into to all nations and to reach all people. 
Our calling is to reach every corner of this globe and to reach every corner of this city. And I am grateful beyond words, and you should be as proud as a peacock because when you attend Shepherd Church, you're helping make this church a church that truly reflects what heaven is going to be like. Amen and amen. Number two, write this down. Jesus, everybody say Jesus. Jesus came to break down the walls that divide. That's why he came, was to break down all the walls that divide. You know, there have always been walls that divide people, and I say this, always. Satan in John 10, verse 10, came to steal, kill, and to destroy, and one of his main weapons in Satan's arsenal is division and strife. I was thinking about all the ways that we are divided. We are divided politically, we are divided racially, we are divided economically between the haves and the have-nots, we're divided morally, we have the sinners and the saints, we're divided in our opinions, we're divided in the teams that we cheer for, we're divided between cat lovers and dog lovers, we're divided between those of us who have hair, those of us that do not have hair, we're divided emotionally, we're divided educationally, we are divided athletically, we are divided relationally. Some of you are married, some of you are single. We are divided spiritually because some people believe that we're justified by works and some people believe that we're justified by faith. We are divided people, we live in a divided nation. And yet the Bible says, I want you to see these words in Galatians 3, 28. The Bible says that there is neither Jew nor Greek there's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And what I learned from that verse is even though we're different, and we are different, I mean, some of you are Jews and some of you are Gentiles, we're different as far as gender is concerned. Some of you are male and some of you are female. We're different as, as far as some of you are the haves and some of you are the have, have nots. But in Jesus, write this down, in Jesus, we are all just one family in Jesus. Galatians 3.26 says that you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Our faith, it's our faith in Jesus is what unites us here together. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 2. I want to read through some of this, and I want you to see, actually see in the Bible how, how Christ came to break down the walls that divide. So Ephesians chapter two, do you have your Bibles, are you ready? Look at verse 14, it says, for he himself, that's, that's Jesus, he is our, what? He's our peace. He has made the two, one. And he has destroyed the barrier, what's called the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh, that's when he died upon the cross, abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and its regulations, stop right there. Now you have to go back to 2,000 years ago in the church. And as, as, as you go back to the church in the New Testament, if you looked out in the audience, you were standing up front and you looked out to see who was there, you would see sitting in the chairs or sitting on the bench or sitting on a pew, you would see sitting next to each other, you would see a Jew and you'd see a Gentile sitting right next to each other. Now the Jews in that church were people of Jewish descent who had followed the Old Testament with its rules and its regulations. And they came and they reached a point in their life where they concluded that Jesus was the fulfillment of all those Old Testament passages, scriptures that they'd studied their whole life. They reached a point where they realized that Jesus was in fact the Messiah and they became what we know today as Jewish believers. They're, they're still Jewish, they're always going to be Jewish, but now they're Jewish followers of Jesus. And sitting right next to that Jewish man was a Gentile. Who are the Gentiles? Well, these people just started showing up in church. They're not Jewish. They don't follow the Jewish customs never studied or followed the Old Testament. They're Gentiles, they, they might be Romans, they might be Corinthians, they're from Asia Minor, they're like Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, a Gentile who decides that he's going to follow Christ 
And so right in church, you have sitting there side by side, you've got Jewish people and Gentile just sitting there in church side by side. And one of the most common problems and dangers back in the Bible, there came certain teachers and leaders and people who told the Gentiles that were sitting there, you're not really saved unless you start following the Old Testament customs and regulations beginning with circumcision. The Gentiles were actually told, you're not saved until you start following the Old Testament code and the Jewish rules and regulations. Now, if you read through the Bible and you read the book of Galatians or you read the book of Romans or you read this book called the book of Ephesians and other passages, Paul, the apostle, makes it crystal clear that a Jewish person is saved when they put their faith and trust in Jesus. And a Gentile man is saved only when he puts his faith in Jesus. And Paul says that when a Jewish person who puts his faith in Jesus is saved, and when a Gentile man who puts his faith in Jesus is saved, that the wall that separates them, that barrier of hostility is torn down. There is no demarcation, there's no division, there should be no strife, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. I want to go back and look at these three verses in Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who's made the two one. He has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Verse 15. By abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And look at verse 16. And in this one body to reconcile both of them, Jew and Gentile, to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. What Paul wants us to know, now watch this, that as a Jewish man, a Jewish man, as he looks to the cross and the Gentile man, as the Gentile man, he looks to the cross. That as the Jewish man looks to the cross, as the Gentile man looks to the cross, that God makes peace with the Jewish man. He makes peace with the Gentile man. And when the Jewish man makes peace with God and the Gentile man makes peace with God, the two of them also make peace with one another. I know if some of you think this sounds impossible, but putting your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone should tear down any barrier that may be dividing us. Point number three, quickly. If Jesus came to tear walls down, which he did, if Jesus came to tear these walls down, then who are we to put those walls back up? There is something in our carnal nature I believe, I think that all of us, all of us have certain prejudices, certain preferences that we can't help but compare ourselves to others. I mean, if you're a UCLA fan, if you're a UCLA fan like me, you just, you just see yourself as being better than a USC fan. Oh, I hope you were blessed today. I don't know about you, but there's something about history that we learn as we move towards the future. And one thing I know is that God's Word is eternal. I want to thank you for tuning in today. I pray if you were blessed by today's message that you will contact us. You can just call the number on the screen. We would love to have you come along and partner with us so that we can continue this broadcast and broadcast all around the world. I know that you know this, but we think that we have the best name of any program on television, Lift Up Jesus, and that's why we exist, to simply lift up the name and the person of Jesus. We want to encourage you to join us prayerfully, financially, verbally, however you can to support us so that we can reach the four corners of this globe. I wanna thank you, please know that I love you. We are praying for you. 
feel free to write to us and let us know if you've been blessed by this message today. And I want you to know that whatever you're doing or wherever you're going, don't forget to always lift up Jesus. I'm Irvin Hurd, and this is my wife, Chip Hurd. And uh, we've been members here at Shepherd for going on 13 years now. Giving is an uncomfortable conversation for most people. And I guess I didn't have a problem with that because when you grow up poor, <laughs> you don't have anything anyway. So everything God gave me, it just seemed right to give back. So when I learned about Malachi and the fact that we were supposed to give back a tenth from the, from the top, not after we do everything else and then whatever's left. And that just seemed to make sense. It was fair, it was loving uh, to a loving God. We work in a seasonal business and uh, between productions and uh, Hiatus. productions, <laughs> yeah, productions shutting down, uh, I didn't have a job. But somehow all the bills got paid and God always provided. And he also gave me a peace during that period because I knew he would provide. We're always having to monitor and learn about stewardship and find ways to make sure that we are doing what God called us to do. And there are periods where it just doesn't look like it's gonna work out. There are periods where it looks like things are just upside down, topsy-turvy. How is this going to work itself out? But somehow, God finds a way to get us through it. And he also gives us the ability to have peace in the process. I have times where I'm looking at the checkbook and looking at what we have committed ourselves to, not what God has committed us to, but what we've committed ourselves to, and having to realign priorities. I think it eventually works itself out. He starts giving you um, uh, wisdom about which thing to do so that you may have a rough this month and a rough next month, maybe an even rougher next month, but somewhere in there, if the heart is to do the thing he asked you to do, he will work it out for you. And that's the part we don't wanna see what's gonna happen. We don't tithe with the thought that we are tithing to get from God. Yeah. We're tithing because we have gotten from God. God has already given to us and all he asks us is to give back that 10%. And so he gave first and we give second. Research proves that it's the regular hearing and teaching of the Word of God that takes our Christian life to a new level. That's why we invite you to meet Dudley Rutherford every week on this station for another powerful message straight from the Bible. You can also visit liftofjesus.com to sign up for our monthly email devotional, discover Pastor Dudley's books and other resources, and see our national TV and radio schedule. And don't hesitate to reach out on the phone or online. Pastor Dudley has a passion and vision to reach more people with a message of hope. And if you'd like to partner with us to touch the world, we'd love to hear from you. Your financial gift will do so much to help us impact the nations for Christ. And if you're ever in the Southern California area, we invite you to visit us at Shepherd Church here in Los Angeles. It's an amazing experience you'll never forget. Until next time, remember to always lift up Jesus. Jesus.